I'm the creator of a project that's called Is This How You Feel? And what I want is for more people to care about climate change. Because climate change is real. Humans are burning fossil fuels, this is releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and this is changing the climate. Scientists know this. Climate change is bad. Sea level is rising, ice cover is shrinking, storms and heat waves are getting more frequent and more intense. Scientists know this. And we need to act. If we do nothing, then by the end of the century, we could be facing four or five degrees of warming. The repercussions on some of the world's most vulnerable people would be catastrophic. Scientists know this. Now, to give you some insight into what I mean when I say scientists know this, 97% of the world's leading climate researchers agree that climate change is real and that humans are to blame. 97%. That's a lot of scientists. That's, like, that's pretty much all the scientists. And you have to presume that if all the scientists agreed on anything, then the rest of the world would tend to agree as well. In the same way that if 97% of builders said your house was about to fall down, you'd look at probably moving out. Right? Unfortunately, this isn't the case when it comes to climate change. Only 60% of the Australian public agree with the scientists. 60%. And even more scary is the fact that that number is echoed right across the world. You've got to ask yourself, why is there such a disconnect between what the scientists know and what the general public believes? Well, I think a lot of it comes down to something as simple as communication. Let me give you an example. Quite a while ago, I myself was a scientist. Now, I wasn't a climate scientist, I was a marine scientist. But I got to spend my days performing experiments, studying cause and effect, using graphs and data and statistical analysis. I communicated with uh, confidence levels and, and graphs and, and precise, thorough language. At, at the start, it was, it was hard. But eventually, I got good at it. It became natural, and it was just the way I communicated. Until one day, I gave up being a scientist, and I started work as a builder's laborer. I went from designing experiments to digging holes. I went from studying cause and effect to digging holes. I went from using graphs and data and statistics to digging holes. I dug a lot of holes as a builder's laborer. But that wasn't the only thing that changed. This clinical and precise language gave way to a more colourful, fluid way of speaking where the vibe and the feeling was the most important thing. I was still communicating. I was just doing it in a very different way. And it was probably around the time I was digging my fourth or fifth hole for the day that I realised maybe we're seeing this difference because of how scientists are talking, how they're communicating. Now, don't get me wrong, scientists need to be precise and clinical when they're talking to other scientists. It lets them be completely certain on everything that they're talking about and sort of together lets them further the collective understanding of a given thing. But that doesn't mean that scientists need to speak in that certain way when they're talking to everyone else. And then I thought, well, maybe I can start approaching scientists. Maybe I can, I can ask them to speak differently when it comes to climate change and see if that can change how people feel about the issue. So I approached some of Australia's leading climate researchers. I asked them to step away from their computer screens and to hand write me a letter, answering one simple question. How does climate change make you feel? Now, I wasn't asking them for a big old stack of peer-reviewed journals. I wasn't asking them for results from a recent experiment. I was asking them for a handwritten letter telling me how climate change made them feel. And this is the first time that anyone had asked them this before. And their responses? They shocked me. It makes me feel sick. It makes me feel sad and it scares me. It scares me more than anything else. This is from a researcher, Associate Professor Katrin Meisner. 
Now, her day job involves looking at historical climate records and building models to predict what the climate will do in the future. Katrin gets climate change. But right here, she's not telling us the likelihood of temperatures being above a certain level by a given date. She's telling us how climate change makes her feel. She's scared. And then this one. Global warming doesn't bother me as much as what it is revealing about humans. Maybe I just need to grow up and get over it, but that won't help my kids any. This is from Professor David Griggs. This guy's the director of Monash's Sustainability Institute. He's authored reports for the International Panel on Climate Change. He gets it, but right here he doesn't sound like a scientist. He sounds like a dad who's worried about his children. Most of all, I feel so very sorry for my children and my hypothetical grandchildren's generation, for all the beautiful things in the world that they will miss. Stephen Sherwood, again, another of Australia's leading climate researchers. This is phenomenal. When I started asking these scientists how they felt, they went from being these boffins in lab coats that can't really talk to everyone else, at least our minds. And turned into real, relatable human beings with real, relatable emotions. And that was the start of "Is This How You Feel?" Originally, I had nine of these handwritten letters, and I wanted to put them in front of an audience. I wanted to see if they could change how people felt about climate change. So I went to my local Vinnies, and you know how in those sort of places there's always these old framed photos of like fruit or cats or something like that. I bought a bunch of those frames, and I popped out the fruit and the cats, <laughs> and then I framed the letters. And I went to my uni, and I held an exhibition. A few people came along, and the response was pretty positive. So I held another exhibition to put the letters in front of more people. And then I put the letters online because I wanted to show them to the world. Then I held another exhibition. Then I started approaching researchers from all over the globe, asking them for their feelings. And then, bang! The website went viral. Then I held another exhibition and another, so that today, the project has been shown in seven ex exhibitions across two countries. The website now houses 43 letters from researchers from eight different countries. At the peak of its virality, the website and social media presences were seeing a quarter of a million people in a single weekend. And there's a thirst for this sort of content. It's been covered all over the world in news and media sources, which is great, right? A bunch of people have seen this stuff, and you know that's good. But is it changing how people feel? Because remember, that was the original goal. I think so. Because we get responses from people that have seen the letters like this, I feel guilt and overwhelming sadness, but I can see I was apathetic. Now I feel moved to do something. That's change. For the longest time, I didn't buy into climate change. Now I'm a believer. That is change. Being a climate change activist makes me feel sexy and free. <laughs> Not necessarily change. But still, a valuable part of the conversation.、Right? But these responses—they're not rare. I've received Facebook messages, emails, written letters from people thanking me for the project, saying that before they didn't used to care about climate change, and now they do. Because that's really what's been missing—the care factor. When you look out your window, you can't see climate change. When you look out your window, you can't see the benefits of acting against climate change. It's this far-off, ominous thing. It's really hard to relate to. If you can't relate to something, you're probably not going to care about it. And if you don't care about it, you're sure as hell not going to act against it. And it's my hope that these letters can start to change that. That these real, relatable emotions can start to help everyone else relate to the issue. Can start to get them to care about it, and hopefully. Get them to act against it. Now, I know a lot of us here today are, are young people, and maybe that taking action—that's the biggest hurdle. Because I accept that you can't go home and whack some solar panels on your roof. I accept that you can't go out and buy a Tesla. And maybe a bunch of you here aren't old enough to vote. That shouldn't mean 
that you stop caring. That shouldn't mean that you give up because there is always something you can do. You can talk. You can talk to your peers, to your parents, to your friends. Tell them how you feel. Tell them the change and the action that you want to see. Because there's a lot to be said for talking. There's a lot to be said for sharing your feelings. There's a lot to be said for writing a letter. I want to show you this photo here. This is a group of students from Hong Kong who saw the project and decided to write their own letters on how climate change makes them feel. Now, that's important because it started a really valuable conversation in their school. But it's also been an opportunity for them to take that first step away from apathy and indifference and that first step towards action. Because they're not just writing letters. These students here and 400 of their peers have handwritten letters and now want to send them and will send them to the President of the United States. In those letters, they're, yeah, they're talking about how they feel, but they're also talking about the actions they want to see. That is real change. That is stepping away from apathy and indifference. Thank you.